Okay, good morning, everyone. Well, I'd like to talk to you today about some work and research that I've been doing here at, at uh, LMU, but also some work that I do at my institute called the, is it working? Hold on. Ah, oh, there we go. At uh, an institute that I founded called the Applied Brain Science Research Institute. As Chris mentioned, I teach religion and science, and really that's my area of expertise. Where do uh, specifically brain science and social neuroscience and behavioral health converge with ancient spiritual wisdom, and how can we can advance this in our society today? So the talk I'm going to be giving today on uh, healing the spirit of a broken world, bridging the art of Ayurveda with the science of the social brain. So this is going to be a talk that integrates a research that I'm doing at the Applied at Apsary, uh, a new book that's coming out uh, this uh, by, in December, but also uh, research that I'm going to do that I conduct here at my courses at LMU. So I'd like to maybe share with you a quote. This is by Dr. Vivek Murthy. Uh, he was the former, most recent former U.S. Uh, 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 Surgeon General. And he has a quote that says, the greatest health crisis of our generation is the illness of isolation. He goes on to say, it is not cancer, it is not heart disease, it is isolation. It is the profound isolation that we, that so many people are experiencing that is the greatest pathology of our lives today. And so I'm going to contextualize that this is a part of our suffering. We are now living in an age of disconnection or in a crisis of connection. Or, put it in another way. We are living in this, uh, um, is there a way to maybe get rid of the, uh, there we go, perfect. So we are living in what I call an age of disconnection, living in a time of social bankruptcy. We are living in a time where more people are experiencing uh, 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 PTSD, addiction, the rate of suicides are going up. Just to give you one example, as Chris mentioned, I did a master's degree in international political, political economics, so I do a lot of research in economic theory as well. This actually was an article that came out from The Economist uh, a year ago that looks at the rise in suicide rates that are taking place around the world. As you can see over here from this, from this graph, there actually has been a precipitous rise in the U.S. in the, uh, uh, in the red over here that shows that over the course of the past uh, maybe roughly 14, 15 years, there has been actually what we call like a, uh, from 10.5 to 13 point, uh, thir to 13 per 100,000 uh, people, there have been suicides taking place in our society, in, in, the, in the United States. The greatest of which are men over 75. So it's not young, reckless youth, you know, guys like, you know, college age kids, it's men over 75 who are, have the highest rate of suicide in, in, in our country today. Just to give you an idea as well, um, the leading cause of premature death in Australia is suicide. So this is, why are we living in, in probably in industrial you know, uh, advanced societies, but we are witnessing tremendous what I call diseases of despair. And so what we find is particularly there is a connection between our social well-being and health. This really is a theme I want to talk about today. The idea that we need, what we're lacking today, is this crisis of connection. Just to give you an example, here's a quote. This is from a recent, uh, uh, I'm pulling a lot of uh, 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 articles from um, uh, behavioral health and social neuroscience. This was an article that came out in 2010. It was a meta-analytic review that says, the influence of social relationships on the risk of death are comparable with well-established risk factors for mortality, such as smoking and alcohol consumption, and exceed the influence of other risk factors, such as physical inactivity and obesity. To put it in another way, well, how much more um, uh, do we find the risk of social isolation and its effects on uh, mortality a, re a, a, a recent report that came out from the American Psychological Association just this year reports this. Strong social relationships have a 50% increase for longevity when compared to those lacking social um, uh, relationships. Social isolation poses a greater risk factor for mortality than smoking, obesity, physical activity, and high blood pressure combined. 
So this is, you know, we, we pay a lot of attention to what I call biophysical markers, such as heart, you know, uh, uh, maybe like heart, heart disease or maybe neurocognitive disorders. But where we need to really focus as pioneers uh, who are advancing integrative health is addressing the social factors that are seen to, seen to be linked to even a higher degree of mortality than all the other uh, uh, factors for risk for longevity that we've, that we've come to address as well. So this is a very quick talk, by the way. So I, I, for those of you who want to learn more, my website has more details about this, or you can come see me and I can actually send you a larger link to this, to this PDF as well, to this, to this PowerPoint. So what are we finding? Well, we're really more homo socialis than homo sapiens. I like to talk to you about this idea of the social brain, looking at the neuroscience behind this. Franz de Waal, who is a primate uh, biologist, has a really great quote that says, our bodies and minds are made for social life, and we become hopelessly depressed in its absence. This is why, next to death, solitary confinement is our worst punishment. So for those of you who know, for countries that abolish capital punishment, their next form of punishment is solitary confinement. What we're finding is that the social brain, the, the brain evolved to the social orient. And you're going to see the neuroscience behind this theory just shortly. But this, this is some of the work that I'm looking at. And I feel very strongly that there are three what I call primal drives or needs of the social brain. This is the need to feel value, the need for belonging, and the need for engagement. What our society has done today, and this is especially the case if, if, you, if, you, if you know um, how automation and computer automation is, is on the rise, workers are feeling neglected. Uh, there are vast segments of our society that, are no, that no longer feel the need to be needed. Uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, recently wrote an article in the op-ed in the New York Times that actually you know, substantiates this idea that fundamentally the greatest anxiety we humans can ever have is the, is, is the feeling that we're no longer needed or valuable to others. And this is a profound uh, issue that needs to be addressed. So I'm going to go into what I call some of the social brain, the, the neuroscience or the brain science research that begins, to, that begins to advocate this idea of how <coughs> We need to nurture our social brain. You know, I think it's wonderful, and I think it, I'm not trying to undermine all the other beautiful uh, and I think uh, uh, efficacy that we find from Ayurveda and yoga. But what I'm also going to maybe add to the mix today is how we need to start nourishing our social brain. And so I want to kind of contextualize this idea from the perspective of evolutionary psychology. You may understand that, imagine yourself 10,000 years ago, and you're uh, uh, you know, an ancient cave person you know, uh, walking around the wild savannas of, of, of Africa, and you're all by yourself. It's getting dark, it's getting cold, uh, you're thirsty, you're hungry, and there are hungry predators you know, on the ground nearby. Your chances for survival are going to increase exponentially the moment you start banding with other members of your of, of early you know, homo sapiens. This fundamental idea of tribe, uh, or, or what I call you know, uh, uh, socialization, was a survival strategy. You know, we kind of think of, you know, I'm going to give you kind of this idea of there are, but there are, there are, there are profound biological adaptations that early uh, uh, proto-humans or proto-hominids had, such as uh, opposable thumbs, uh, vocal cords, uh, anatomical differences, you know, uh, uh, innovations such as walking upright. But, and there are also what we call behavioral uh, strategies, such as domestication of animals, uh, cooking, uh, the ability to uh, 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 control fire. But beyond all of that, what we're finding is that the most, the ability for early humans to tighten the tribes is perhaps the most powerful adaptive tactic that enabled the human species to thrive in an unpredictable and harsh world. I want you to think about it this way. Evolution favors survival at its most basic level. So any innovation in evolution, whether it's biological, uh, uh, psychological, or behavioral, has to somehow be uh, uh, an, an adaptation that, that promotes survival of the species. What we're finding is that the ability to form into tribes became what we call a functional strategy for survival. 
this strategy for survival to band into tribes became a, a, a functional strategy that got passed down into the genes of everyone alive who's ever been alive, every human being. Every single one of you has that functional strategy encoded into your DNA, wired into your brain, and even you know, uh, embedded into your psyche, this idea for tribe. There really is fundamentally what I call a primal equation of the social brain. And if you remember one thing from this talk, it's this primal social, the, the, this primal equation of the social brain. Attachment to your tribe equals life. Abandonment from your tribe equals death. And that was literal. That was actually literal back then, the day when if you were kicked out of your tribe or you were somehow ostracized from your tribe, fending for your life was far more precarious than if you were part of this larger structural unit. So we see today, this is even true then today, the need for tribe and the need for uh, 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 um, connection, the need for cooperation, the need for community, for coexistence, is something that we fundamentally is fundamentally part of our human nature and wired into the brain. Let's now look at some of the recent evidence to come out in the past few years that supports this idea of the social brain. So here is some neuroscience uh, 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 information. So when you here, there was a, a, a study that came out in early 2003, in 2003 about uh, 14, 15 years ago, that at UCLA by Matthew Lieberman and Naomi Eisenberger, who looked at what would happen if we put humans into an fMRI and measured what happens into their brain. They were playing a video game, and what they didn't know was that in this game, when they were in the fMRI, there was, uh, uh, they were playing what, like imaginary like catch with what they thought was some other person in the room, you know, in the laboratory. And, but what they, what they didn't know is that it was actually a simulation, it was a computer. And after a few rounds of passing the ball to this person, the fMRI, who was seeing it on the screen, it stopped. And the, the ball wasn't passed to them, it got passed to other people. This is what they wanted to measure. What would happen in the human brain when someone feels social rejection? What would happen in the human brain when someone feels ostrac being ostracized or, neglect or neglected socially? And what they found was remarkable. What they found is that the area of the brain that regulates physical pain, which is, as you'll see over here, if you look over here, this is the area of your brain experiencing social pain and the area of your brain when you're in physical pain. Social pain, uh, you get you know, rejected you know, uh, you know, from, from your tribe or you get, uh, you get a divorce or you find out that you, got, uh, you lost a job interview, got fired from your job unexpectedly. Physical pain, you hit your uh, uh, toe, you know, uh, uh, on the, uh, you stub your toe, or you hit your uh, thumb with a hammer. That's physical pain, obviously. But here is something remarkable. The same regions of the brain, which is the, uh, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, registers and fires when you are experiencing social pain or physical pain. And what they found also quite remarkably, the same areas of your brain that regulate pain, that regulate distress, which is the, uh, the right uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, are also overlapping regions. Sorry, overlapping regions. What we're finding is this. There was a neurological, what we call a neurobiological strategy that allowed for overlapping regions of your brain to respond to social pain just as powerfully and similarly as it does to physical pain. What this means for you and me is that your brain cannot distinguish between physical pain or social pain. Pain is all the same to your brain. And so what this does is that it reveals, this was one of the first, uh, what we might call, uh, uh, you know, solid pieces of, of, of evidence from, from neuroscience to uh, advocate and affirm this theory of the social brain. And there's more. If I had more time, I would show you uh, uh, all the different, sy different systems from the dopaminergic reward system, oxytocin receptor system, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortical axis, to the vagal tone function, to oxytocin receptors, to neuronal systems. But I'm gonna show you one 
very powerful system in the brain that also substantiates this, this theory of the, so, of, of the social brain, uh, the brain evolving as a social organ. And it is this. Social pain equals physical pain. So considerable, considerable evidence from human and animal research supports the hypothesis that physical and social pain rely on shared neural and neurochemical substrates. Although surprising in some ways, this co-opting of the primitive physical pain signal to indicate the possibility of broken social bonds highlights the critical role that social ties have played in the survival of the species. There was one system in particular. This is the opioid system in the brain. Some of you may know about this, but this is one system I'm gonna focus on, and there are many more. I'm just gonna focus on one of them just today for, for time limitations. And this is the idea that this, there is a system in the brain that regulates our pain control. It's our natural, the opioid system is our natural, uh, nature's way of regulating pain in the body. What we're finding is this. This is from uh, Matthew Lieberman, one of the pioneers in the social brain model from UCLA. Social attachments functioned by piggybacking onto the physical pain system and did so through the opioid process. Opioids are the brain's natural painkillers. Their production and release diminish the experience of pain. The idea that the human brain evolved, that developed a mechanism to release opioids in order to soothe the pain of separation to stress is known as the brain's opioid theory of social attachment. What this means is when you are in pain, whether that's physical pain, emotional pain, social pain, spiritual pain, psychological pain, your brain automatically, will, will, your, your brain's opioid system will release. What they didn't know until just about five years ago was that this system, the opioid system, also switches on when we experience social distress, when we experience a social isolation, social neglection, social abandonment, the system turns on as well. Think of the opioid system as nature's original analgesic, its original Advil. And in the absence, this is the thing that's very important, when we don't have social connections, we don't have the ability to tribe, the brain is not able to, uh, the brain's opioid system goes into dysregulation. So we will have to find other vehicles or other means to mitigate that pain. Alcohol, drugs, checking your iPhone every five minutes. This, my friends, is the neurobiological origin of addiction. When the brain's opioid system is not functioning properly, when we lack the ability to try, if you will. So this is a very powerful, you know, um, um, I think, you know, real life um, uh, uh, manifestation of why we need social attachment. So I want us to now maybe here today to look at a new model for pain regulation or stress regulation or a new model of looking at illness and disease. This is called the biopsychosocial spiritual model. Some of you probably heard the term biopsychosocial. I'm adding this other element, which is the spiritual, because I think that's lacking today in the medical uh, paradigm. And I think it's very important that we consider and integrate the spiritual dimension as well. So you, you, you normally won't hear the word spiritual in medical literature, but you will start seeing the term BPS, uh, biopsychosocial, but I, I'm adding the extra S, which is the spiritual. So when we experience a lack of feeling value, belonging, and engagement, we experience stress or illness or disease or pain in the form of biological, which is physical pain, psychological, emotional pain, social, social pain, and spiritual, existential pain. This is now a new model that helps us to understand the, uh, the ways in which uh, we experience pain, how the human brain processes pain, and how we can start regulating pain and disease through this model. So I want you to let me look at some of the research coming out. So just if you want, if the previous example, the biopsychosocial spiritual, this is some research which has come out to affirm how the social brain connects with all of these uh, four different elements. Well, research has come out that shows Social connection is shown to affect specific genes that govern immune function and regulate the inflammation process. 
Well, why is it so important? Well, we know inflammation is one of the key factors attributed to everything from Parkinson's to dementia to uh, Crohn's disease to other um, uh, uh, neuro neurocognitive, you know, gastro, you know, enterological uh, diseases as well. Psychological. Research has come out that shows that social support decreases anxiety, oops, almost time, uh, decreases anxiety and depression, controls addiction and trauma. Social, bonding builds trust, creates stronger teams and more resilient communities and spiritual. Pro-social behavior increases compassion and empathy toward others and boosts self-worth and purpose. So let's turn this idea into there are multiple dimensions, multiple, multiple dimensions of healing. We can see that stress and trauma are not just isolated to your brain or body, but equally impact the spirit and society as they implicate our very human existence as spiritual social beings who seek value, belonging, and engagement. Health spans self and society. Ayurveda knew this. Ayurveda medical doctor and ontology knew this from way, way back, that at its core, Ayurveda is philosophy and medical ontology of transformation. Self, bringing the self back into wholeness is health. And we, when we are back in wholeness and in health, society is as well. There's that connection right there. Ayurveda offers a framework for healing what is broken and fragmented within self and society. There are some key terms I'll go through very quickly that express this idea of biopsychosocial spiritual regulation. The, the Vedic term sarva, wholeness and health. The Ayurvedic term svasta, abiding one's natural state. And the Buddhist term sangha, community and tribe right there. And fundamentally, as I wrap up over here, we need to start asking our, this question, where are we broken in our world today? So this is the question I want to just end with and, just, and then maybe start the tone for today's talk. Where is humanity broken? Where do we see fragmentation? Are we asking the right questions? Maybe we start asking the questions. Where does it hurt? Whom do we make invisible? What is sacred? Where are there violations of justice? What can I do? Having the courage to ask the right questions is the beginning for transforming personal and planetary consciousness. And ultimately, it's about what I call bridging the science with the sacred, which is what we're doing here today. The power in the solution is equivalent to the courage behind the question. So I, I, I challenge us today to start asking the courageous questions. How can we begin to fix and heal the soul of a broken world? What can we do? What can we do to bridge Ayurveda philosophy and the wisdom of the ancient traditions of the healing of Ayurveda, bridge it with modern science, medical, neuroscience, research to help uh, 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 what I call, you know, to, uh, to heal the soul of a broken world. And lastly, I just want to say, I'm, uh, for those of you who want to learn more, as Chris mentioned, we have a wonderful program here called the Yoga Mindful Social Change uh, Certificate Program. I'll be presenting much of this information at my talk October 29th uh, at, uh, here at LMU. You can talk to me or Chris, anyone about more about this, this program. And lastly, I just want to say, uh, my new book, The Currency of Happiness, goes into all this research and more of the brain science. It's coming out at the end of December. And I like to say, to socialize is to survive, to tribe is to thrive. And that really is the motto of what we do at my institute, uh, the Applied Brain Science Research Institute. So thank you very much.